This week, Rob Chevelle, co-founder and CEO of Abin and Delete Me, will be on to talk about new security threats stemming from PII Online. Then Haseeb Awan, CEO of Afani Incorporated, joins us to discuss the rise of SIM swapping attacks. In the security news, a LinkedIn breach exposes user data, why MTTR is bad for SecOps, three things every CISO wishes you understood, USA is a cyber power, is ignorance bliss for hackers, flaws let you hack an ATM by waving your phone, and more. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. When it comes to web app and API security, the choice is simple. You can choose Fastly's security solution that teams will actually use in full blocking mode, just like 90% of their customers. Or you can stick with costly options that you probably just turn off. You can get Fastly's all-in-one platform that protects apps everywhere they live, however they're built. Or departments can agree to disagree. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Fastly to learn more. Or you can just wish you had. Do you ever wake up in the morning and wonder where you can get quality meat scented candles? That's right, quality meat scented candles. We got it all duck, ostrich, bison, buffalo, you name it. We have the finest meat scented candles down here at Crazy Paul's. All you can buy for $19.99 meat scented candles. Get them before they're gone. Welcome to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode number 701, recorded on July 1st, 2021, right here in G Unit Studios in Rhode Island. To my left, Dr. Doug. Hello. <laughs> Everyone's job is to start uh, decoding Doug's shirt during the show. That is the that is that is the goal is to decode Doc Doug's shirt. On the lines of remotely, Mr. Tyler Robinson is here with us wearing a flowery shirt today. Very nice. Yeah, just enjoying the tropical heat wave, so you know, figured we would dress for the occasion. Mr. Lee Neely, who must are you also experiencing a heat wave? Or it's like yes, Idaho. indeed we are. You are okay. I think I'm slightly cooler than him, but you know, as they say, what do you, you know, when you're talking about a beehive with no neck, un, no no exit, it's unbelievable. Oh, <laughs> I've never heard that expression. Tyler Lee, Lee thinks he's cooler than you. Just throwing that out there, <laughs> just letting that sink in. Um, I mean, he might be. Yeah, he's a beehive with no exit. <laughs> If you want to stay in the loop, all things Security Weekly, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. You can subscribe to all of our shows on your favorite podcast catcher. Check our YouTube channel. We're live streaming on Twitch. Sign up for our mailing list. Join our Discord server all at securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Then we've got webcasts. They all happen at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So on July 14th, learn how to reveal and protect your entire attack surface with the fine folks from Psy Cognito. Then on July 15th, learn how a thoughtful approach to SASE can improve security and enable scalability with the folks from Cisco Umbrella. And finally, on July 22nd, a technical training where you'll learn how guided SaaS NDR enables rapid response with Gigamon. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to register today or check out slash on demand for the entire archive, at least the last year's worth. Anyhow, Rob Chevelle is the co-founder of Abin and Delete Me, a longtime advocate of privacy legislation. He has been quoted on such publications as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and The Telegraph. He joins us today for a deep dive into the data broker industry. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, I'm excited to get my uh, meat scented candles after participating. <laughs> That's <laughs> They're going to go great with my uh, KFC scented fire log. Yeah, that's awesome. Great stuff. <laughs> Rob, how did you get your start in information security? Well, uh, I had actually been uh, on the other side, uh, not an entrepreneur, but an investor at uh, SoftBank. And I saw all of the venture capital money going into social networking, uh, Facebook and all the other uh, sharing uh, technologies, and I decided, 
you know, it seems like a stupid idea to do every, what every everybody else is doing. Why not? Uh, why not do something that's the opposite of that? And that took took me down the privacy rat hole about ten years ago. And myself and a couple of much smarter guys from MIT uh, started uh, this company, which is an online privacy company, one hundred percent dedicated to that issue. Outstanding, Rob. When you say the data broker industry, can you describe that for our audience? Sure. Um, you know, data broker is a pretty generic term. It can mean a lot of different things to different people. Uh, the way I, and there are different kinds of data brokers. The ones that our service to lead me tends to focus on are things like whitepages.com and Spokio and checkpeople.com. And there's a million different uh, variants of these things. But effectively, you can think of them as what, ha when, what happened when the phone book went online? So when you type in somebody's name and the city they live in, or perhaps a cell phone number, uh, that kind of a, of a thing into Google, which we would call a people search, typically the top results on the first couple pages of Google are littered with uh, what we term data brokers, advertising the ability to sell you a full profile uh, of that person's uh, personal information details, such as their date of birth, their uh, full contact information, their past addresses, their employer, the net worth of their house, their family members, names and ages, and more. If you know where to look, you can find all that stuff for free. <laughs> That is true as well. Uh, and that is part of the data broker's game because the more info they expose for free to Google, the higher their SEO ranking is and the higher the ranking they're going to get for that query that you type in. Now, are, there, are there very specific ahead, brokerage accounts that live kind of above some of these, these main ones, like basically brokers to the brokers? People like Clear... Uh, where they're obviously pulling info from their database, but they're also using things like uh, TransUnion backend API services, which is part of a you know your required credit account. So, are there kind of the what's the the overlay of what the ecosystem looks like for the data? Yeah, it's a great question, and you know if we were to graph it out or try to represent it visually, it would be a total mess. Uh, arrows pointing everywhere, circles within circles you know, flow charts, triangles, because none of these guys will reveal exactly where their information sources are coming from and where they're going to. And if you ask any of these data brokers, who do you sell to? They'll, uh, you know, wink and, and say, uh, uh, you know, we, we sell to lots of different organizations. But the, the, the truth is they'll sell to anyone, somebody coming to their website with a credit card, or an organization outside of the U.S. that's willing to pay them for a whole bunch of uh, append data uh, that they use to do targeted personalization. Uh, they'll even sell to hackers if they seem legitimate, uh, which is another reason why phishing as a threat has gotten so good at personalizing uh, the messaging to, uh, to different potential victims. They definitely sell to people who want to sell me an extended car warranty. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's my that, you hypothesis. Know, and, and, you know, in one definition, you know, just going back to your first question, uh, what's a data broker? Is somebody that has a bunch of information about you, me, us that we never gave it to as a first part. So they've aggregated information from, uh, a, 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 as you guys were saying, other sources. That could be our credit reports. It could be our airport records. It could be government. Uh, DMV and RMVs that sell this information. It can be apps that we download on our mobile phones. I mean, it is just a total free for all out there uh, that that the average person doesn't know about. Once you uh, submit your data somewhere, it goes into uh, you know a sort of a wild west marketplace where it's constantly being traded, resold, and aggregated. Now well, the, good, somebody... the good places. Is... I was just going to say we mentioned the phone book. Um, and you used to be able to pay to get your name and number removed from the phone book. 
but it sounds like not only do we have that, op- we don't have that option today necessarily, but we don't have control of our data, so it doesn't even end up in the phone book. And it's more information than what was listed in the phone book, which is also scary. Those are, those, those are all like exactly the case, except for the first point, which is why we created Delete Me, which is mm. you can now pay us to, uh, and services like us, obviously, uh, to go remove uh, your information from uh, the, what, what is equivalent to the new Google phone book. The problem is there isn't one. Uh, you know, remember how there used to be one phone book in every region that we yeah. lived in, if you're a million years old like I am? Uh, now, unfortunately, there's dozens and dozens of data brokers uh, approaching, uh, you know, actually hundreds in the United States that have detailed uh, information about most uh, individuals. And so uh, the task has become, uh, you know, much harder and more expensive, unfortunately. And the data that they have ain't just your name, number, and address anymore. And, and even, uh, you know, what we're seeing uh, in terms of the data the data brokers have about us is a troubling trend that they're getting better at aggregating more and more detailed information about us. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, how because the, the other day I was writing this script that was going to populate a table, and I was wanting to make up all these fake people for this because it, it was a research experiment. I was wondering, what if, what if I made a whole bunch, like, variations of my name and I push them out. Do they vet this stuff, or, or could I just almost denial of service my name by creating, you know, a hundred million people with the same name and similar addresses and things, so that it would just be a total, you know, deep sea of garbage? I love the way it, you think. It, you know, it's actually not a bad strategy to do that as an obvious as an obfuscation technique. Um, we've we've even considered uh, and experimented with it. Uh, so it is it is possible uh, to, to to run those kinds of plays here uh, for the average person. Uh, however, it's not going to write scripts to generate all kinds of variations of uh, their personal information, which is slight slightly different and confusing. Um, you know, I think the the good news is, you know, there are uh, there are ways to opt yourself out of the major. Uh, data brokers and aggregators out there and you know if you know we charge about 130 bucks a year uh to do that on a continuous basis across you know tons of these guys uh but if uh cost is a concern we also publish a free guide on our website and we break down step by step you know how to do these uh removals which unfortunately are are tend to be different you know, for each one of these folks. Yeah, I was going to so, say you you must have a, a subscription service, right? Because this is a moving target. You have to constantly keep on keeping your data out of. Because the next time you go buy a car or buy a house, you got to go then back behind yourself and clean it all up. Yeah, we're con- you know the sad truth is we're constantly generating you know new data that mm. eventually finds its way into these data brokers' profiles about us. Uh, you know, it's sort of an impossible problem to solve perfectly. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is you can, you know, get 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 a significantly lower digital footprint without a lot of effort. And then we also have a complementary tool that we offer, which is something you download, install in your browser called Blur, which which allows you to generate alias information, mm-hmm. much uh, like mm. like uh, like you were you, you were saying you were thinking of doing. Uh, so when you're registering for a new website, we create a new email for you on the fly just for that website, new phone number. We can even generate you a new credit card if you want to do an online shopping transaction. Do, do you th- In that same light, so let me flip it around again on you. Do, do, you, do you think that you could over-delete yourself? Uh, I mean, like you could get to a point where I mean, I impl- that, well, that was a movie. It was called The Net. It starred Sandra Bullock. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, but I was, I was I was thinking that like when you go to buy a house or you go to get a job, people immediately start searching for your information. And I was thinking of it as the same context of me flooding my name out there with like you know a hundred different addresses in the same town. I was like, what if somebody was searching for you for legitimate reasons and they weren't finding you or it looked like you'd been obfuscated? I wonder if that would have like an impact on, on I, I was trying to think about like me hiring somebody. If I search for a name and, and I search for Paul Asadorian and I, and I saw he just doesn't exist. I, I, it would be definitely a first question at the interview. It causes yeah. issues in government clearances. I can tell you that. I right bet. Now. Yeah. I can only imagine. <laughs> yes, it does. Tyler says from experience. 
that was me saying that, not Tyler, by the way. I think, you know, particularly if, if you're if you're online trying to sell meat scented candles and you remove, you know, all trace of yourself, it's gonna be a problem. Uh, you're just not gonna sell as many. Yeah. But um in in reality, I think uh the data brokers are not removing yourself fr- from the data brokers does not cause that kind of issue. If you okay. if you make a sustained effort to uh, change your name uh, and or sort of disappear from, um, you know, what I would call, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the data, uh, the world, the world of, of, of digital data altogether. Uh, that's a much different value proposition and it causes uh, different issues, including, uh, you know, with background checks, uh, government uh various government checks and things like that but the percentage of people that are actually trying to uh effectively become anonymous uh rather than lower their digital pr- footprint is a, it, it's a very different ball game mm. tyler t- sorry did you have more questions you got cut off a couple times there no, I was just curious. Yeah, I was curious kind of around the like ad tracking data and the things that you're continuously allowing to track you as you move forward like that that continual tracking, obviously the subscription is helping with that, but the backend data that's being released by these brokers, uh, say from network IDs or or cell phones or things that are going to leak uh, your ad tracking IDs that you really don't have any control over, that continual battle, is there really a, is there a great advantage to continually trying to remove or limit that footprint? And then take that one step further from a from a stance where you want to be somewhat in the public light like we have a podcast and network we try to get the branding out their personal brands are important is there a advantage to removing or limiting that footprint from uh for those kind of reasons yeah i mean a couple different questions there uh you know one is you know is it even worth fighting the fight uh, with all the tracking, I think that's uh, you know, that's going on uh, inside our phones and our browsers and things like that. And I think, uh, you know, obviously I'm biased, but uh, you know, I think both uh, Tim Cook and uh, you know at Apple and and Ed- Edward Snowden and myself, you know, would give the same answer, which is hell yeah, it is. And 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 there's actually a variety of very simple things you can do that. Uh, you know, sort of get you eighty percent of the benefit with twenty percent of the effort. Um, those things are, you know, add a tracker blocker to your browser. You know, an ad blocker, uh, and you know, Apple's actually allowing, you know, with with their new, um, you know, versions of iOS, is sort of making that, you know, very easy to to Mark Zuckerberg's dismay. So there's a few things like that uh, related to tracking that really do work because then. You know, these third parties are not receiving your IP address everywhere you go across domains and and being able to put it all together. Is it perfect? No. Uh, Is is there always going to be information about us leaking out uh, that gets tracked? Yes. Uh, Unless you're, you know, some kind of uh, CIA or espionage OSINT, you know, professional type. And even then. Uh, you know, we've seen people uh, from the Silk Road and, you know, the dark web and so forth uh, get found, get arrested, you know, that sort of thing. It's very, very hard to do. Uh, the second question is, hey, you know, I'm a public figure. Should I delete anything about myself uh, when, you know, I, I, I in a sense, my, my business is, is being in the public eye? And, you know, ironically, uh, Removing your personal information uh, from data brokers like our Delete Me service does is actually most popular, uh, I would say, with media professionals. And the reason for that is simple. Uh, Removing yourself from these data brokers does nothing to reduce the, uh, as far as we know, to reduce the amount of publicity, traffic or rankings, uh, you know, that that you would get as a as a person in the. In, in, as a media influencer, uh, but it makes it that much harder for somebody who wants to dox you or mm-hmm. take an opinion that you've expressed and react to it uh, in a personal way, visiting your home, harassing you, uh, harassing somebody in your family, you know, 
what delete me does is lower um you know the chance that somebody can act out in an emotional outburst uh, using personal information that's easy to find so i had i had the two questions uh one is you were talking about you have a subscription model so it's doing an ongoing check so do you incorporate the equivalent of a am i being stupid detector that you know help people make better choices and my my second question is is there you mentioned these minimum set of controls do you provide guidance for folks to you know set a minimum privacy posture or make sure they're not you know running with scissors as it were yeah it's a great question um we we have not taken the approach of we're going to be a the 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 information resource for everyone's privacy uh posture uh we'd rather let you professionals uh be that <laughs> be that conduit to uh to an audience uh of course we blog and we have newsletters and we have our you know we put our ideas and recommendations out there we uh, we have a large uh, and dedicated support team that tries to answer, uh, you know, every question that comes our way. But, but, but the bottom line is, you know, we offer a set of tools and services that try to do, uh, you know, a, a reasonably good job at uh, both stopping, helping, helping you not run with scissors in the sense of giving you a choice of whether to share your personal information when you're going to be conducting your life online anyway, which almost everybody is, uh, and those are those tools we give you in this uh, in this product blur, so you can blur your ID in effect as you're going about your digital life, and then we go clean, um, you know, make sure you're cleaned up uh, with Delete Me, and we do that on an ongoing basis, so you don't really don't have to think so much about it. Your information. Uh, is going to be monitored. Uh, we're going to tell you where we found it. We're going to tell you what we found. We're going to give you a real, and we're going to tell you what we removed. And we're going to give you a really re clear report on exactly what the heck we did. Um, and uh, and that's why it's a super popular service, and it's growing, uh, you know, uh, more more than doubling every year now. Rob, <clears throat> sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have a choice to Lee's point. Or do you want to educate the users and be like, like, don't put your personal information there. But I want to use like the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles in your state as an example, where I, from very light research, believe that when you register a vehicle, for example, uh, that you don't have a choice as to what happens to your data after the fact. Is that is that true? It's absolutely true. And the only good news, the only good news in that department is the legal and regulatory side of this uh, debate and this crazy marketplace that we're all discussing today uh, is getting better mm -hmm. for the consumer. And by that, I mean, laws are popping up across states and potentially uh, will be nationalized in the Biden administration, we'll see, that give consumers more rights over those things like a visit to the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles where mm -hmm. you're filling in a form, you're giving them all this information about you, and it doesn't appear that you have a choice. Well, these laws are going to give you a choice to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to check a box, and you're never going to sell that information. Right. And if you do, you're going to be in trouble, and there's going to be teeth behind it. Yeah. And, and so the DMV, various DMVs in the U.S. are selling that data to data brokers? Yes, that is 100% true, and it's crazy. Guy, I remember having this conversation with the dealership, and I was like, you, you can't sell my data. He's like, dude, I am. You're, here's, the, here's the form. You sign here. He's like, dude, I don't sell your data. He's like, guess what? It's the DMV. Go yeah, like, have you ever it. been to the DMV, like, right? It's yeah. like, I'm like, oh. That, but that, does that really explain the car warranty 
I, you know, I, I can imagine that conversation at the DMV where you sit there for seven hours and you finally get to the window and go, okay, I want to talk to you about my data and be like, uh-huh. Yeah. Like, know. no, I, I don't want you to sell my data. Uh-huh. <laughs> you have to get in a line over there. Take a number. It's, yeah, and, and it'll be four And you or asked five about hours. your data, so therefore you're last. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all know uh, car salesmen, and particularly the used car salesmen, they're going to lead the charge in the privacy, uh, in the fight for privacy, I'm pretty sure. Um, but you'd be amazed. It, it's beyond the DMV. Uh your utilities mm -hmm. that you're signed up with yep. have a sophisticated data broker that sells uh, data on when you move, when you sign up for a new electric service, uh, you, you know, gas, uh, whatever. Uh, the, um, you know, bro uh, um, you know d uh, stock brokers are selling the data on your trades uh, tied to your personal information. Uh, it, it, you know, what happened, guys, is, is that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we created these credit bureaus, uh, you know, the friendly Equifax, Experian and TransUnion. And those guys were regulated by Congress. But since the Internet, uh, all of these data brokers and aggregators have been completely unregulated. And what's happened is exactly what you'd expect. There's thousands of them and there are no rules. Mm -hmm. That's really and you start to talk about like voter databases too. There's a lot of interesting things that you can glean from, like you said, a voter's database or a utility bill. There was a lot of research done by some of the utilities on whether they could tell how long you watched a particular cable channel based mm -hmm. on frequencies being used through electrical current. Like, tell me that research is obviously not worth some money to put that level of effort into something that's not even the cable company. This is the electric company. So the disparate data sets that are being correlated, and then you start to bring in technologies like AL and MI or, or ML and AI, have a drink, uh, that's when you start to really see some interesting things when you can correlate this mobile ID tied to this ad tracking ID was next to this wireless and had this IP address and has all of these... Uh, correlatable user events, let's send them an ad relating to this particular zone where we think they may end up. Like all of those things are all geared towards the consumer. That's a pretty dangerous data set when you start to think about a government getting their hands on that or uh, someone that has nefarious actions. They can start tracking, making educated guesses on where you're going to be, what you're going to do, when you're going to arrive somewhere. Uh, and essentially, we're losing the privacy of an not really a non, a non, uh, being anonymous, but really where we're going to end up and what we do in our personal lives. And that's all just from passive data. Imagine when we start to talk about the active data that's available. Uh, yep, and you know that's why this whole political uh, debate has been a tremendous accelerator of awareness around these issues because all the data used by the political action committees and all the data purportedly used by different nation states to, uh, you know, mess with uh, the debate that, that happens in our democratic process is absolutely based on data broker data, 100%. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you point out, both the AI and ML technologies are starting to use this data to do what I would call algorithmic decision making or what you know some smarter people than me call algorithmic decision making which means that all this data that we don't see collected about us uh about all these little things that we don't think are too important and we're not too concerned about sharing them well when they get aggregated up provide a pretty damn good picture of you know who we are what we're going to do you know who are who our important relationships are with and that data is being used by fed into these AI engines that are making decisions about us that actually have pretty potentially big consequences, whether it's about healthcare coverage that we mm -hmm. can or can't get uh, and our families can or can't get to employers uh, giving us uh, jobs, uh, you know, to 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 other things. Um, I think it's it, it's a really important issue. And we haven't even mentioned uh, facial rec. Mm. I, that, but that doesn't wrong, even touch know, what, the. What scares me the most is not so much the government, and maybe not even so much like 
Google because I think there'll be a source of that data. And mostly Google's trying to shove ads down your face. I mean, if the government wants to spy on me, I truly believe they've got other ways to spy on me. What concerns me is some of the things you said, Rob, right? Is my health insurance going to be impacted? My car insurance going to be impacted? Am I not going to be able to get a loan? Am I going to not be able to get a job? All because there's data being collected about me that's basically being used against me, hiking up my rates for all of those things that that I have to pay for. That to me is scarier than the government spying yeah, I, on me. And I worry more about my my kids actually than than mm. myself, right? Like like you're saying, you have family members that submit uh, genomic data to these DNA companies that are that are running sequencing, and we can very accurately determine whether or not you're going to have Alzheimer's or cancer or some genetic disorder. That probably won't affect me in this lifetime. But that data then mm. is going to be correlated and utilized for my kids to then get health insurance, life insurance. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in my direct tree. That can be, you know, my grandma, my aunt, my uh, second cousin. All of these people are genetically tied to me and their missed decisions about their privacy directly affects me and my offspring moving forward. Tyler's predicting the dystopian sci-fi future. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> it's been a, I so, feel like he was describing a lot of sci-fi movies. So, that, so yeah. my friend Lou was one of the people who was a pioneer in writing these, what, are, what they were calling big data algorithms that were using AIML mm -hmm. to look at very small correlations in behavioral patterns to try and say, you bought this beer maybe you'll buy this other thing too and you know and trying to pare things down by using these massive mm -hmm. data sets from big retailers they could start to determine what people were going to do and how to tempt them with other things that went right along with that and, right. and just by shifting it like a tenth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent it translate when you multiply that times a billion dollars a year in sales all of a sudden it becomes a significant number and he was doing a lot of stuff with that for some large retailers and mm -hmm. and i see why they get into this because you can do the same thing with all those like you were saying they can do this with your insurance mm -hmm. they can say what's the likelihood you have a car accident based on maybe not the things you think Mm -hmm. You know, because that was what the whole big data with the retailers was about. It wasn't about looking at traditional things that are obvious. It was about looking for other things that were patterns or things that were just out there. And they might be able to say your insurance rate should be 40 times what it is yeah. because, you know, you, Fitbit sold us you your bought, data you bought a and you're not chip. sleeping well. You're, you're, you're on you're Security blood. Weekly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. There were no questions in there. We were just... <laughs> We were like all <laughs> over the place. So, but. Well, I mean, you know, I think any anyone as a parent uh, is thinking about this for sure because the all all kids and you know I'm I'm a parent of a young youngster and you know all these kids are digital natives. They're developing their data sets for God knows who from you know a very early age and. Um, you know what exactly as you guys were riffing what what happens with that and you know what little pieces of it are used for what purposes it's it, it, it it's hard to know so i think you know it's easy to it's easy to be dystopian and 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 say hey all you know there's nothing we can do about this we're going into this mass massive uh event horizon of uh of complete data representation of everybody but I, you know, I think we have to, you know, be a little bit more positive about that. And I think the good news, again, is that there's some simple things that, you know, any any of us, whether we're technical uh, or not, can do that that dramatically uh, improve your, uh, you know, your 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 data footprint. And what we see across the world, not just in the U.S., but across the world, is governments passing legislation giving consumers rights to their data and rights to enforce mm. their privacy. And, it, you know, Europe, obviously, with the GDPR, but uh, Brazil just passed something. Like I said, there's a lot of legislation active in the United States, state by state. Obviously, California is a leader. And even our good friends over in China uh, several months ago passed a data protection law, whatever, uh, whatever that means. So yeah. there's just, you know, a massive amount of attention to this issue now because it ain't going away does does starting earlier provide a better protection blanket for people like our kids where we're starting to limit their digital footprint at an early age and and moving forward 
I think the answer is yeah. yeah. I'm I'm wondering. <clears throat> you mentioned the the, the privacy les- legislation and all, um, which I think will help you know the legitimate providers. But you gave me the impression earlier that the data brokers are going to do anything they can to get that data. Will it really make a difference, or am I naive? I think it depends on how much, like like any laws, it depends on how much teeth are behind them. Um, you know, what have we seen with data breaches? Uh, you know, laws helped uh, bring those things to light. It's not like there's that many more data breaches today than there were, you know, five years ago. It's just that we know about them because there's laws that say you have to report them these, these days. And now there's cyber insurance policies that cover uh, harms and damages and things like that. So it's an evolution. Uh, and, you know, I don't think anybody can predict how effective, uh, you know, these kinds of rights are going to be, but we need to have them uh, in place before we, I think, uh, can even run, the, you know, and answer the effectiveness uh, question. That said, you know, whether or not you know, m- most of the, most of the big data brokers out there, you know, they do have to abide by the laws under the jurisdiction they're in. So, you know, okay. they they comply with opt out requests today, uh, and that's why a service like Delete Me can be effective because it actually works, and they do take down and remove uh, exposed listings. Well, I, let me ask a tag on question of that. So, I mean, I mean, like all my data was stolen in like the OMB breach. So I got, I, you know, I got one of those fun letters like, oh, we, your top secret data was, you know, procured by some unknown third party. I'm like, gee, thanks, guys. But um, I mean, so even if I go out and I sanitize myself, isn't that other data that this sort of illicit data is still out there and it's just going to start, it's just going to come flooding right back in immediately because I don't know how to, how to get rid of we don't, I mean, the U.S. government has never acknowledged who stole that data, and they're probably selling it if, you know, it's the North Koreans or somebody because Kim Jong-un needs new clothes now because he lost weight. So, you know, I mean, they have to sell a bunch of data off. I mean, is it is it worth it, or are we too late? So it's now, like, just a little too late to get healthy? Um, so the answer is, is I think, um, Kim Jong needs meat-scented candles. But uh, <laughs> the... Wildebeest, the that's is, our most popular seller. <laughs> I, he's going to love them. Um, the answer is no, because there's a difference between the dark web, which is where all the data breach data goes to live or die uh, or be traded uh, uh, you know, between hackers and so forth, and you know, legitimate data brokers providing uh, either Google search result profiles and or background checks or uh data sets to uh to different companies and political committees and all this you know uh insurers all the people we've we've talked about uh today and the difference is the data brokers uh need to buy and aggregate their data from uh legitimate legal sources not from the dark web yeah, but, so, but aren't there then just like okay. going to be sort of data launderers who who sort of go as you know? So I'm pretty unethical, you know. My meat sitting candle business is not doing so well, so I start buying and collecting data off the dark web. Sort of set myself up as halfway legitimate. I sell it to you. You say, "Hey, we're pretty legitimate," and and then you know I'm Mister Legitimate Data Source. They go, "I'm buying it from him. He, you know, I he's a legitimate guy." Data so. money laundering. Yeah, it's data laundering. Yes. It's, uh, and I, I could really see that. I, I'm, I'll be right back. I, I, I have I have no days. doubt that it happens. I have no <laughs> doubt too. that it happens. And, you know, frankly, one of the reasons we have a subscription service is because a bunch of these data brokers are, you know, for lack of a more empirical term, shady as, you know, as, as whatever uh, adjective you want to throw on mm-hmm. the end of that. And Shady's they don't, good. you know, so who, who knows who, who the hell they're, they're buying data from and how, uh, you know, how legal their practices are. And, and they won't tell you. Did, did we ask you how big a business this data broker is? It sounds like it's billions. It's billions. It's hundreds of companies and billions of dollars. Uh, and in aggregate, 
I believe they even spend uh, close to a billion dollars in Google ads. Wow. So, so it's a big business. So if it's that big, would they not be advocating against the privacy laws? Oh, they are. They're, they're, <laughs> oh, 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 my, man. Uh, they, they're teamed up with the Facebook lobbyists and the Google lobbyists. These guys are spending... 10x what they spent you know five years ago uh running around dc and uh you know it's 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 a problem yeah no just I, uh, I, in, in fyi uh a a1 steak sauce has a line of meat scented candles in case you're curious <laughs> about that <laughs> but they don't have wildebeest i bet uh i don't do, do a google search you, wildebeest and musk ox is, is kind of the one wildly entertaining for. Um, I want to talk about voice assistants for for a moment, Rob, because I'm I'm kind of creeped out. And so I'll preface this with: I got rid of the Amazon devices largely because I didn't want it being tied to purchases. And most of my friends are hackers, and if I have to remove another 55 gallon drum of lube from my wish list on Amazon, <laughs> get real tired of that uh, as well as other various adult related items. It never gets um, old. Come on. And also like, you know, my kids would just order stuff and they're like, well, you can put a password on it. I'm like, yeah, but I got to verbally say the password that like, you think my kids are stupid. Like they're hackers like me. So got rid of the Amazon and, but I still want a voice assistant so I can control my home and do other things like play music and do the basics things. But I don't want it tied to my my purchases. Like other, so we'll have, and I don't know if this is how true this is, right? But we'll have a conversation. Lots of people have reported this. And then your ads on Facebook are related to that mm -hmm. particular conversation. And you bet. And, and is that, is there are ways to, to stop that? Is that about my data being out there? Is that more ad tracking, Rob? Like what's your thoughts on the, the voice assistant? Well, you know, I have my personal thoughts and, and then there's sort of what you can do about it if you want to uh, have the convenience of, hey, Google, hey, Alexa mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And, you know, my personal thoughts are, uh, and, and by the way, I, I have a Facebook account. I'm not, uh, you know, a tinfoil hat guy. Uh, I use the Internet much like most people do. Um, but. I don't have, uh, uh, you know, a voice assistant in my house and I'm against using it because I am concerned that this huge data stream of my, myself and my family's voices, keywords, habits are being picked up 24 hours a day uh, under this innocuous little thing that Google and Amazon are basically giving away for free mm -hmm. and uh, trying to make my family incorporated as another family member. Um, so I just, you know, everybody draws their line somewhere, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I'll get on Facebook and check it out, but I ain't using a, a, I ain't bringing one, I ain't bringing one of these guys into my house. Uh, but that said, uh, look, they're super fun. They're super convenient. It's fun to play music, control lights, ask for the weather, the news, all this kind of stuff. Uh, cooking directions, timers, mm. my friends use them all the time. Yep. And there are settings that, you know, that you can go, uh, turn on and off that, that, um, provide some level of help. Um, and then, uh, under, under some of these laws that I'm talking about state laws, like California's privacy law, you can go in. And we will be introducing these kinds of offerings in our Delete Me service under the same subscriptions that we offer today. We will be broadening uh, what we opt you out of. But you can go and, and, and sort of request to cleanse the history of uh, your audio files with those providers. Mm, that's awesome. Because there, there, there is a convenience factor, as you, know, you outlined, but you know, there's also privacy concerns as well. You, 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 you're never going to get away from that. We're all, we're all trying to live our lives. You know, we don't, we don't get up every day and think about privacy. Privacy is a secondary mm. consideration because we got to go live our lives, get things done, have fun, uh, and, and, uh, be efficient. And that requires data. And so, you know, we have to live in a world where we're constantly balancing, uh, convenience, uh, security and privacy. And I, I think that some folks trade their data for things and don't know it. Because I had this discussion with my wife. And she's like, I got the Dunkin' Donuts app. 
And she's like, I get free coffee. I'm like, no, you don't. She's like, what are you talking about? Like they scan my app and I get a free coffee. I'm like, well, what did you have to put in to get an account and what permissions does the app have? Cause they're selling that data most likely on the back end to pay for your air quotes, free coffee. And she's like, Oh, that, that's nice. But I, I still want my free coffee. <laughs> as long as they don't see how good the aggregation of this data is, it seems pretty innocent. Mm -hmm. And Hey, I love free coffee too. Right. It, you can't, you can't blame people either. Right. But I, I've always advocated for that visibility and control. So I may want to make some of those trades, right? My data for free coffee, but I, I want to know what data you're collecting and who you're sharing it with is really my only ask. And it's amazing how so many instances, we don't have visibility into that. That's right. And, and, and the problem, you know, people in the industry have been talking about this stuff forever and, you know, in my opinion, they've never made it as an entrepreneur. They've never really made any progress. And to keep saying, you know, hey, people will trade all their privacy for 25 cent, you know, gift card. And doesn't that prove that people don't care? And then privacy advocates are always saying, well, people need to be able to see, you know, with a clear label what data they're giving away. And, it, you know, look, as an entrepreneur, my opinion is, you know, people have to live their life. Like I was saying, mm -hmm. they, they want things for free and they want certain things that are convenient and that's not going to change. So with an entrepreneur's mindset, you have to think about services that, um, that people will value where you can deliver a high amount of convenience around privacy. And frankly, that's what we want, uh, you know, selfishly, that's what we want to lead me to be. We want it to be sort of the easy button for your privacy, give you that visibility, give you those privacy rights, take care of a lot of that cleanup for you without you having to go get up, you know, any day of the week and, and, and really worry about it. It's not going to be perfect, but we want it to be, uh, you know, the best, the best, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, service out there for that. Tyler, Doug, Lee, more questions for Rob? Well, I, I will, I will, I'll comment because I will say that we were doing some just, I, I have contempt usually for most, and, and we were experimenting with that and we put up a website that was like, get a free account on mrfufu.com, mm -hmm. which was a website that I own the domain for and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't promise anything and people were signing up mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, you sign up for this, you didn't even get anything, but you got a free account that doesn't do anything, but I got your data. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, so, yeah, so I usually register as, you know, Nigel Fuzzybottom or something on those and, and uh, put, or my cat's names is what I have. Uh, I have those loyalty cards in my cat's names usually. So, and you had a cat named Mr. Cat. I had a cat named Mr. Cat. I have a cat named Dr. G. And now everybody's got my cat names. I got, hang on. I got to go change my secret security. Now, now, that, now the data brokers, uh, they, have own, cat names. they own me. Yeah, they got those already. So, <laughs> Those cats have loyalty cards all over the place. Mr. Mm. Cat, he's got he's got a stop and shop card, a gas card. He he like he likes those uh, regular coffees at Dunkin' Donuts and gets a free one on his do you birthday. See, do you see a, a future? Obviously, you guys are going to continue to expand, and this is probably never going away. So I don't see any any problem with your business model. This seems like a great place to invest. Honestly, let me know where we're investing. Mm -hmm. uh, but from things like voice recognition and facial recognition, like from a future roadmap standpoint, are these going to be services that are kind of going to be more of a concern and things that may get integrated later down the road? 100%, yes. You need uh, uh, to issue night vision goggles <laughs> and laser pointers, right? Because I learned, I never knew this, that night vision goggles, you can see the, is it the LED lights from a night vision oh, camera? Oh, you can see the emitter, with, yeah. With the emitter with yeah. night vision goggles. They, they make a nice uh, infrared one for your key ring, too, that I mm. carry around. Yeah. That, works, that works a little bit better than carrying nods around. Yeah. Are, are you that red blur I keep seeing on my cameras? Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is that? Yep. It's the laser pointer. <laughs> yeah. The instructions just say it must be swamp gas, but I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes it looks reflective a little like in, infrared lotion. I'm yeah. gonna start wearing <laughs> infrared lotion. I just I just try to tiptoe up with my meat scented candles lit. There you go. Right to the door. 
Love the meat scented candles. Yeah, this episode's got to be called meat scented. Candles. Absolutely, it does. <laughs> Rob, we just have uh, three, uh, five questions actually for you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Ready. Let's do it. Three words to describe yourself. Um, impatient. Uh, active and um impatient active and sometimes fun <laughs> if you were a serial killer what would be your weapon of choice meat and a candle i mean what else could you answer that <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself what would the title be <laughs> <laughs> he wants to say it so bad. <laughs> say it. Say it. Uh, Mr. G. <laughs> what is your favorite hacker movie? We mentioned one during this segment, actually. Yeah, yeah we did. We did. Uh, I, I'm going to go with uh, Red Dawn. Oh, very nice. Oh. Cool. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Edward Snowden and Aretha Franklin. Wow. Outstanding. Rob, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show uh, and sharing uh, all the knowledge with our audience. Uh I, I, I tell you what, I'm going to go sign up for Delete Me. It, yeah, it, no, it, I, know. I, I think I think you got us all convinced here. I was on the already show. scoping it out. Yeah, yeah, going, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I already my signed up. Card. <laughs> I get yeah, the, double, the, break. the double family plan here. Like, I want to be erased yep. twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, thanks so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Thanks for having me, guys. It was fun. And uh, next time, I'm bringing my cocktails with me. There you go. <laughs> Coming up next, Hasiba Wan. Stick around. <laughs> 